Anyway, welcome to everybody. This is the Tennessee Native Plant Society Native Plant Seminar Series, and our speaker tonight is Paula Gross. And you know her name, whether you realize it or not, because <laughs> of... Um, because of a book, of two books that she co-wrote with Larry Mellenchamp, both Bizarre Botanicals, and I know that's not going to come up very well, but there's Bizarre Botanicals. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one is, is the Southeast Native Plant Primer, both of which are great books, fun books, <laughs> and very useful. So... Larry Mellenchamp originally said he would come, but then he realized, oh goodness, I have to travel to Cullowhee on that date. I can't do that talk. So I said, how about Paula? And he put me in touch with Paula and Paula was kind enough to say yes. So we have Paula Gross with us tonight. She's got quite a strong background in Vegas. Um, She's a former associate director of the University of North Carolina at Charlotte Botanical Gardens. She taught university courses on botany and plant identification, um, led the creation of children's and adult public education programs, and couldn't keep her hands out of any aspect of growing a botanical garden. She's currently investing in the next generation of plant lovers and protectors by teaching sustainability and botany at Davidson Greer School. Her deep belief in the power of plants is what inspires her to write and teach. She has a master's in horticulture from the University of Georgia. She is co-author with Larry Mellenchamp of the books Bizarre Botanicals and the Southeast Native Plant Primer. And she was the Southeast Regional Online Reporter for Fine Gardening Magazine from 2019 to 2020. So welcome, Paula Gross. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Yes, thank you, Karen. Thank you. I'm honored to be here because um, plants and especially native plants are as evidence from that bio there are my heart and mind's love, delight, and inspiration. Um, and to be able to speak about them with others, others of what I call the green tribe, those of you that are plant lovers, is heartening and strengthening endeavor. Um, the world needs us more than ever. Um, and so I'm just, you know, pleased to connect with, with others in this way. And so North Carolina, the Charlotte area is my current home. Um, and as you mentioned, I worked for 20 years at the UNC Charlotte Botanical Gardens. And UNC Charlotte Botanical Gardens were um, founded by a biology professor back in the late 60s. And then one of his students was Dr. Larry Mellichamp. Um, he wasn't a doctor at the time of being a student, but he went off to um, Michigan to study and it just so happened that a job was open when he graduated and so he came back to UNC Charlotte and then proceeded to just really build the botanical gardens and um, he's an amazing um, botanist, uh, horticulturist, um, just really an amazing person. So you know North Carolina is where I'm at now but Tennessee is actually my home I guess you would say. I lived there from age 8 to 18 till I went off to college. Um, my parents still live there. Um, Tullahoma is where I'm from which I don't have to say to y'all you probably don't know where it's at because you probably do. <laughs> so um, you know in some ways Tennessee will always be my home and the Tennessee Native Plant Society, although I have not had direct contact um, with, I am so very grateful to for, you know, being a part of this book. <laughs> so this book, which you should recognize, of course, Dennis Horn's um, Wildflowers of Tennessee, when it came out, um, was just the perfect book 
for teaching plant identification and appreciation of wildflowers to um, like a more um, an interested, educated audience, but not at the university level, which I was using the manual for that. And so I've just loved that book ever since and have recommended it to so many people. So thank you, Tennessee Native Plant Society for helping bird that, that wonderful book. All right. So um, let's see if I can get, there we go. So as I mentioned, and as you've mentioned, um, I can't um, not talk about Dr. Larry Mellichamp because this really is a program that was created by him. Um, and we were colleagues and he was my mentor and definitely my friend and co-author. Um, and he, we've already mentioned this book that I had the pleasure of writing with him, um, the Southeast Native Plant Primer. But prior to that book, and some of you all may have this other book, is The Native Plants of the Southeast that he wrote. And um, similarly to the Southeast Native Plant Primer also includes these amazing photographs by um, Will Stewart, who is a amateur, but almost professional level naturalist, butterfly lover, bird lover, and photographer. Um, so the Native Plants of the Southeast is, it really includes more even than the Southeast Native Plant Primer. It came first and it is Larry's magnum opus <laughs> and really his heart and soul. So if you do not have that book, I highly recommend it because it was written for you all. It was written for an audience of Native plant lovers, people that you know, are, are already have this sort of, of love. Um, and then the Southeast Native Plant Primer, as I mentioned before the program started, is a great book to pass on or to gift to somebody who is starting interested in plants, has heard something, you know, about native plants and their value, but is kind of, you know, unsure um, or a new gardener or um, someone who might need a little coaxing. So it was written with an encouraging tone and I hope that it gets the word out um, about gardening with native plants. And of course, a native plant society, you all um, appreciate native plants in their habitat, in their, you know, in the wild. I don't like to say in nature because we are all in nature. I am in nature right now, but in the other than human world. Um, but for a lot of people, um, you know, their interaction with plants is going to be around their home, okay, in, in a garden. So, are you a tree hugger? <laughs> Probably many of you all will answer yes <laughs> to that. And Dr. Melichamp, as I mentioned, is a, a scholar and botanist. He is also a tree hugger, one of my favorite tree huggers. And here he is hugging the champion North Carolina wild big leaf magnolia. Now you all have the pleasure on the other side of the Appalachians um, to have a greater populations of big leaf magnolias. For us, they're really um, kind of rare. And um, however, regardless of where they're found, they're special trees. So another one of my favorite tree huggers is um, Donald Peaty. And if you don't know that name, look him up. He was a naturalist and really probably America's foremost naturalist in the 20s, 30s, really 30s, 40s, 50s, um, into the 60s. Um, but then he kind of seemed to disappear. Um, he wrote many, many books, um, but a wonderful book on the natural history of North American trees. And actually, that was two different books. It was an Eastern book and a Western book, and then now it's published together. But <clears throat> even though this is a book about trees in your landscape, I had to include a quote and I will just read it, that the first reward of tree study, but one that lasts you to the end of your days, is that you walk abroad, follow a rushing stream, climb a hill, or sit on a rock to admire the view. The trees stand forth, proclaiming their names to you. Though at first you may fix their identity with more or less conscious effort, the easy to know species soon become like the faces of your friends, known without a thought, and bringing a host of associations. And what more to, you know, have 
surrounding your home than friends. So, well, you know, most people do like trees. Um, they're not a hard sell. They're not, not as hard to sell as like a ornamental grass, you know. Most people like trees. Trees tend to have memories associated with childhood, seem to invoke emotion. Um, this Here's a picture of me in the redwoods with my son, who is now 12 years old, um, in really kind of a life-changing experience, experiencing the grandeur of those trees. And then in the middle is one of my students at the Davidson Green School, which is a nature-based school. And that was not a stage picture. You know, often we stage pictures with our children and grandchildren. We're like, go hug that tree and I'm going to take a picture. That was not a stage picture. We were talking about trees and we were talking about one tree that was going to have to be cut down um, because of a construction project. And it wasn't this one. And just spontaneously, this, this girl like hugged the tree and told her, how, told it how much she loved it. And the other picture on the right is a tree that actually a tulip poplar that was going to have to be taken down because of damage. And these are the students kind of appreciating the tree before it goes. So no, most people do like trees. So trees have amazing <laughs> benefits beyond just our emotions and our um, childhood memories, of course, just enormous benefits to life on earth and therefore to humans. And so you can read it yourself, but to the younger generation, I say, imagine if trees gave off Wi-Fi signals. We'd be planting so many trees, we'd probably save the planet too. Too bad they only produce the oxygen we breathe. So it's a good reminder. So trees and all plants, but trees especially, do provide the air that we breathe, the oxygen that we breathe. They are carbon sinks, carbon sinks. So in other words, as they take in carbon dioxide and they utilize it and convert it into glucose and then convert that into the structures of the plant itself, that carbon is locked up. And it's the unlocking of the carbon and the producing of carbon dioxide that is one of the main contributors to the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere which um, these human sources of increased gases, including carbon dioxide, are you know, leading to the warming um, climate. So we, you hear a lot of talk now about carbon sinks and trees are one of the major ones. Um, oceans and plants in oceans are also a major one. We for, sort of forget about that, but trees are, are huge carbon sinks. And so, planting trees, if for no other reason, and planting trees and allowing them to grow on up for no other reason than trapping carbon dioxide in this day and age is a huge benefit. They are temperature moderators. Um, not only do they block the radiation coming in, but they also literally cool the air literally cool the air. And so there's energy and money savings associated with that. So sometimes people, you know, say, oh, well, they, they sort of bring everything back down to the bottom line or to money. Well, trees actually are a economic benefit, well-placed trees, appropriately placed trees around buildings and in cities and in areas that where you have a lot of heat build up. Um, because they will literally cool the air and, of course, block um, the light that is will also heat up the side of a building and increase its temperature. Um, and then as far as stormwater, so you're talking about um, a situation where you have a lot of impervious surfaces. And as the water starts running, um, it can cause erosion. It picks up, um, you know, all kinds of pollutants and enters streams and into you know other water sources so this 
con this um, dealing with stormwater is really, really a big issue outside of, you know, a rural area. Um, and so trees have a huge benefit in taking up the stormwater and then the air quality. And again, these are especially energy and money saving in urban environments. <clears throat> stress reducer, stress reducer. This is proven, this has been scientifically proven by study after study after study, everything from prisons to schools, um, in their ability to literally change the physiology of our bodies just being around trees or green in general. As a major thread in an ecosystem and in a web of life, they support, they themselves of course are a source of biodiversity, but they support a wide amount of biodiversity, a, a variety of creatures from the soil, everything happening in the rise of fear that they're part of to the, their, their branches and their structure to their leaves, to the leaves that fall on the ground that then become part of the system. So they're, they're really a huge link in that web of life. And of course, soil stability, which I mentioned. So yes, most people like trees. It can be evidenced here, in this urban uh -huh. setting. But you know, also most people like dogs. <laughs> but how do you choose one? How do you choose one to bring it into your home? You know, under uh, how, when you're thinking about, you know, I'm gonna get a dog. Do you just say, hey, you know, that dog, there's a dog, there's a dog on sale. Oh, somebody gave me that dog. I think I'll just take that dog. Um, usually not. Usually we pay a lot of attention to, choosing a dog and choosing the right dog. And so we look for things like size, like this gentleman here on with his chihuahua, and clearly he needed something <clears throat> to balance himself out. So, you know, size is one issue or the poor little girl here who's being dwarfed by the, the Great Dane. So sometimes we don't always make the best choices when it comes to size, shape, behavior, when it comes to dogs, behavior is a big issue. But we also look at what their needs are. So we think, does this dog need a lot of walking? Does this dog, you know, a lot of grooming? Um, you know, does this dog need to be around other dogs? Does it need to be around people? And then we, we pay attention to their issues. We're very, you know, interested in what, what problems does this breed have? Does this breed shed? Um, so we will go into a lot of um, thought, forethought, and um, examination when we're choosing a dog. And so the thesis really of this program is to put that same kind of forethought and care into choosing the trees for your landscape, that in a way they're as big of a decision, a longer lasting um, decision than choosing a dog. And in some ways they're, they can be like, like a pet. So in how to choose a dog, um, one thing you might do, and it's, you know, if, especially if you're very analytical and very methodical, is you're discussing, you know, I want a toy poodle and my mate wants a border collie and we're arguing about it. Um, so we're going to make a chart, right? We're going to make a chart. We're actually going to rank these attributes and to help us make the decision or help us make our argument again um, for what dog we're going to have. So for instance, we might look at size, as I mentioned, activity level, um, a particular breed, which I might want because of just a just an emotional appeal or a visual appeal, but also I might be avoiding a certain breed because of genetic issues, maintenance like shedding or grooming, the temperament, um, and the history of a particular dog. And so here I've ranked for what my needs are, right? What, how this, these toy poodle versus a border collie ranks. And it's a way to try to um, move beyond just my emotional, or maybe just having one factor that is so strong for me. Um, that, and that is making me say, no, I have to have a toy poodle. But if I rank it out, then I may see, oh, yes, I've 
I see what the other issues are. It really is a way of um, looking at the big picture, looking at the big picture. So here, Toy Poodle won out. So this is a program about tree use and selection in the home landscape. From large forest trees to smaller flowering understory trees. So as you're, you're here listening to the Zoom and looking at the Zoom, think about your own landscape trees. We'll just take a, just take a you know, few seconds. Think about your own landscape trees and what you like or don't like about them. What you like, don't like about them. And now as members of, the, of a native plant society, you, you inherently notice and think about trees more than necessarily like the average person. So a lot of times we talk about plant blindness and we talk about how, oh, it's, well, well, there's just a big tree. Yep, got a big tree out there. But what, what, what about it in particular? And what tree is it? Get to know that tree. So in this case, you can see this river birch. Okay. So, whoops, and go back. <laughs> so, take a look at the features of the trees in your landscape. Maybe survey the trees in your landscape. I think that's an excellent exercise. Um, because again, even though we're geared towards plants to begin with, do you know, could you list all the trees in your garden? You very well might be able to, um, but it's a great exercise to do a survey of your own property. And of course you could include shrubs and perennials and all that, but just start with the trees, right? Their location, their form, their size their function, and it really should say functions because they have many functions. So for instance, in this, this slide, I like this slide because it's got off there to the left, it's got a, a conifer, a big pine tree, which, you know, kind of looks like it's getting close to the power lines in this, this aspect. It's got this focal point tree, this palm, which is hmm, giving a sense of place. Might not be the place it actually is at, but it's giving, it's definitely evoking something. It's like a, a exclamation point in the landscape. Then you've got off to the left, um, dogwood that would provide like beautiful flowers in the spring, but loses its leaves in the winter. You've got screening shrubs or possibly trees. In this case, I think they were trees that were kind of pruned down into shrubs. So lots of different um, ways in which trees can function in your landscape. So you can begin to start thinking about it. And again, as you're looking at, you know, why do I have this here? Um, what is it that I appreciate about it? What is it that might be an issue for me? If you like a lot of trees around your house, then you're going to have many choices. And if you have space, so that's the other really, really big factor is how much space do you have? If you have a quarter acre or less, your ability to include trees in your landscape, for the most part, is going to be smaller unless you go this route with many trees or maybe not so many trees. So if you're not going to have many trees, then you want to choose wisely because your tree might outlast your house. So a quick review about what is a tree? And sometimes I get this question, surprisingly, what's the difference? Well, I mean, what's a tree versus a shrub? And there actually is a definition. There's multiple definitions. But the one I like to use is that a tree has a single larger trunk or single trunk, I can just say, and is generally greater than 20 feet tall. So in this slide, there's a maple, there's a deciduous maple that is clearly a tree. There's a spruce there, that conifer, that is a tree, single trunk greater than 20 feet tall. What is a shrub? A shrub is multi-trunked and generally smaller trunks, meaning smaller diameter trunks and less than 20 feet tall. And so there's an example, the example there is a arrowwood of viburnum dentatum. 
but you can have overlap and modification that can sort of turn a tree into a shrub and a shrub into a tree. So, and you don't worry too much about that. But for instance, this Eastern red bud, which is multi-trunked and maybe a cultivar that is smaller, or maybe just because it's being grown out in full sun, it doesn't reach quite the height of 20 feet. So it's acting in a sense more like a shrub. Or in the other case of the other image, a witch hazel, um, American witch hazel, a Hamamillus virginiana, which would normally be a shrub, multi-trunked, can be trained into a tree. Evergreen versus deciduous is certainly, you know, um, aspect of, you know, what is a tree and something when you're looking at the basic characteristics of a tree. So evergreen just means it maintains some green foliage all year round. So it doesn't mean that it has to be a conifer, okay, as this center tree is. It can be a broadleaf as you see the magnolia off to your right. Um, so evergreen just refers to the condition of holding its leaves, um, not that it is a conifer. Because you can also have a deciduous conifer like the um, bald cypress. So the Taxodium disticum there with the absolutely gorgeous orange fall color. Mm -hmm. That is a conifer that is deciduous. And in the back, there are some poplars, probably some Italian poplars, the yellow color, which is not a native plant, you have a deciduous broadleaf. All right, so turning back to the landscape, what are the values of trees in the landscape? And again, this is a personal, this is somewhat personal, but when you look at the you know, what most people would, would say, or most people um, look for, probably one of the biggest things, the first things is to give context to the home as a landscape feature. Um, and that's along with foundation and border shrubs. So trees are just part of that formula, but they're a pretty important part of the formula. So even if you live with these beautiful mountains in the background, you still need the trees to bring things into context. Um, the larger shade trees and the smaller flowering trees. So it's bringing your house into context. It's well, also providing um, sort of a, a diversity in a sense. And in a sense, it is mimicking a habitat as far as its um, um, varying levels of, of canopy. You know, and different habitats, microhabitats within one space from all the way from the, the large tree down to a ground cover. And as I mentioned before, just in the larger value of trees, but specifically they cool the environment and your house. And while this is showing more like a university campus, um, this cooling aspect cannot be underestimated. Um, anyone who has had a trees blocking a Western exposure and then lost trees blocking a Western exposure or maybe moved somewhere else where you didn't have trees, um, you have literally felt the difference. But of course it is measurable. Um, trees will drop the temperature in their vicinity five to seven degrees. Um, and that is just measuring underneath the trees. And that is due both to the blocking of radiation and especially evapotranspiration. So evapotranspiration is where the leaves themselves are like little air conditioners, essentially. The leaves, as they are releasing water vapor, and that is evaporating into the atmosphere, that is creating a cooling temperature. That is that evaporative cooling function. Um, and they're doing that constantly. You take away the tree, you have taken away that, that um, function of, of evaporative cooling, essentially taken away air conditioners. Um, and so, blocking radiation from 
the outside of a structure that would then absorb heat from direct radiation is also a very significant, it makes it, it can adjust um, by 25%. Like it can, can save you 25% in sort of heating, cooling when you're having deciduous trees, which of course are perfectly designed to have shading in the summer when you need that to cool your house, lose their leaves in the winter to allow the radiation to heat your home. So it's kind of a beautiful and perfect situation. And um, it was just um, depressing in a way to have um, structures without trees, at least somewhat nearby. Um, we, we have already mentioned in some part that they're just beautiful. They're attractive forms, textures, and colors. And so in this one image um, on the left, you see a weeping tree, you see a vase-shaped tree, you see a tree with a rounded crown, and then of course you see beautiful um, conifers, the pyramidal form of conifers. And just those shapes are, are beautiful. Um, and then of course, colors of foliage and you know, add flowers to the mix. And of course on the right there is the famous rising sun redbud, which came from plant breeder in Tennessee. Um, fall color. So not only the color of the, you know, through the year or through the growing season foliage, but the fall color. What would we do without fall color? So those of us that grew up in a place with fall color, uh, can you imagine life without it? I mean, it's a small miracle that happens every year. It is a marking of the seasons. Um, it's, it's really one of the nature's, you know, art, art shows. <laughs> so fall color, certainly something that we value as we're driving around, as we're hiking, but also in our own, bring that into your own landscape and enjoy that. Flowers and fruits. So um, that's definitely one of the <clears throat> main attractive features to many people are the flowers. So um, trees, not all of them, many of them, them don't have attractive flowers, but those that do are like a huge bonus. And Magnolia grandiflora have some of the most stunning, large, fragrant flowers um, of trees, native or otherwise. And of course, they're native, not native directly to most of Tennessee, but to the Southeast. Um, and then on the right corner, you'll see, um, I had made a post sometime back about a cherry, uh, or that people talk about their flowering cherries in the show that they make, but that picture is a red bud. So I think that is just as gorgeous as any flowering cherry that I've ever seen. Um, that was a particularly floriferous year. <laughs> and Magnolia grandiflora also makes beautiful seed, seed heads, seed cone heads. Um, all right. And those fruits are attractive, not only to us, but perhaps even more so we appreciate, or many of us appreciate what they do for wildlife. So trees in general provide this function of shelter, to wildlife, um, and you really can't underestimate that when it comes to a wide variety of wildlife and specifically insects. Um, the amount of insects that trees can shelter, or provide home for, not only food for. Now, you know, traditionally, you wanna say in the horticulture world, think of insects as a bad thing, but we realize now um, or we have always, some of us have always realized that insects are a vital, vital part of the web of life and that the health of our ecosystems. And, and we would be so sad to not see the birds, to not have the butterflies. You know, I already have noticed such a diminishing of butterflies from when I was younger and it's, it, it hurts, you know, I don't want to not be able to see these creatures in the world around me. And so it's really 
not that complicated <laughs> in a sense. Um, and I know you all are all familiar with Doug Tallamy and his work bringing nature home and nature's best hope and his thesis of the importance of caterpillars to feed baby birds and then baby birds grow up into adult birds. Um, and then fruits and nuts for all kinds of animals. So Doug Tallamy talks about those keystone genera, meaning um, particular genera of trees that feed and support the most amount of wildlife. And so oak is thankfully for those of us that are in the horticulture industry or in horticulture thinking about things from something other than the wildlife value. Um, oak is at the top oaks are the kings of trees in so many ways. And they're amazing, long lasting um, landscape plants. They're slow growing, but they're amazing. Some of the other keystone genera, um, wild cherry, elms, poplar, willow, um, those all have high, high wildlife value. They're not necessarily the best for a small landscape. Um, so it's it is a important feature to think about. If you have a limited amount of space and deciding what you're gonna choose, you have to decide what's most important for yourself. Um, there is this National Wildlife Foundation Native Plant Finder link. It's somewhat limited, but the thing I like about it is if you go there, you can type in your the genus of tree and you also type in your zip code and it tells you how many species of insect that tr those trees support. And so it's kind of a neat um, little tool. Unfortunately, it doesn't have, um, you know, it's not huge. It doesn't have everything um, by any means. So um, more features that we look at are interesting bark, foliage, other kinds of ornamental value. So like the flaking bark of the Betula nigra of the river birch, or those wonderful glossy green and then the brown undersides of certain magnolia grandifloras. Um, and that cultivar DD Blanchard is one that has just really, really striking um, dark undersides. It's a big magnolia. It's one of the big cultivars. Um, smaller ones would be like Little Gem or Teddy Bear. And then tax, like Taxodium disticum or bald cypress, that ferny foliage, um, it's, I find that extremely attractive. And if you believe Pinterest, they also make good places for tree houses. So, you know, that's the last landscape value of trees that I will mention there it is the ultimate manifestation of your childhood tree house desires. So apparently these are real. Um, and if you're building one of these, please invite me sometime soon because they look delightful. <laughs> now, there, those were advantages, but there, there are disadvantages of trees to the landscape. Um, and again, all of this is personal. So this is, you know, you're thinking about it, you're hearing the advantages I'm talking about, and some of them resonate with you and some of them don't. Same way with the disadvantages. So one that we hear a lot and perhaps can be overblown, however, if this happens to you, it's certainly not overblown, is that trees can fall. They can fall on houses. Um, you know, that is a risk. And so you have to ask yourself, well, you know, how risk averse am I? And it speaks to planting the right plant, the right tree in the right place, taking appropriate care of it and occasionally having an arborist come out to look at it or occasionally having an arborist um, if you have concerns about it. Um, trees really are a specialty in and of themselves in the horticulture industry. And so you finding a good arborist is, is a valuable thing to do. So share, if you have a good arborist, share that name with your friends and, and neighbors. So, but they can, they can drop limbs. Um, seedling trees can have poor form or rank growth, meaning um, if you get volunteers, and I know Tennessee is the volunteer state, but if you get volunteer plants, tr seedlings in your yard, and you think, I'm just going to let that, you know, red maple grow up. You can do that and then you can have an intense emotional, um, you know, connection with it and you may want to do that. However, the seedlings, you know, sometimes have 
poor growth form, um, the southern magnolias especially. Um, you know, as you get to know the trees and you see them more and more and you talk to people about them, you start to learn which ones from a landscape perspective are more worth seeking out particular cultivars than others. And Southern Magnolia is one of those that is definitely worth seeking out a cultivar. And in my opinion, you know, there is a lot of talk about cultivars and their value or lack of value. When it comes to trees, um, it, for the most part, a Southern Magnolia seedling versus a Southern Magnolia cultivar is going to serve the same ecological value as far as supporting wildlife um, and, you know, the leaves, the flowers, et cetera. If you're concerned about um, restoration, you know, you're doing it, there's a restoration project going on. Absolutely. You don't use cultivars, but in your home landscape, I think there's great value to using cultivars, especially in trees. When you get down into some of the other herbaceous plants, then you really do have to look at things like the flower color, the doubling of the flowers, you know, does that affect pollination? But when it comes to trees, mostly they've been selected for size or form, um, rarely for some kind of distorting feature to a flower. Okay, so there, for instance, now the cultivar of the red maple, um, so Dr. Melichamp's example there of the seedling red maple and its form. The other thing with the seedling red maple, um, the, there's a red maple wild type on the left there in the picture and a, and a red maple cultivar, October Glory on the right. And earlier in its life, you can see some difference. You can see some difference in form, um, but you can especially see a difference in fall color. So if this kind of, you know, fall color is dear to your heart and you're going to have one tree on your property, plant the cultivar red maple, get the fall color that you want, and you still get the wildlife benefit that you would get from a seedling red maple. And maples are ones that are quite supportive to wildlife. So um, another disadvantage is that roots of trees can distort driveways and sidewalks and um, surface spread into the lawn. And so in that case, you know, obviously in none of y'all are going to do this. You're not going to plant a sidewalk. You're not going to plant a tree in between a street and a sidewalk like that where you have three feet. Okay? Um, surface spreading um, root trees. Some of the um, maples can be like that. Some of the birches can be like that. So you just need to be aware again, and that's in learning about your trees and which ones have surface roots. Oaks eventually can also have those sorts of surface roots. But to me, as long as you haven't placed it right next to your house, you haven't placed it right next to a sidewalk or a patio, it doesn't bother me. Um, people, you know, say, oh, well, lawn mowing. Well, hopefully under your big, beautiful oak, you will not be mowing the lawn very much. Speaking of lawns, um, one disadvantage to some people is that trees shade the lawn grass and it, they suck water from under plantings. In other words, it's competing with plants underneath. However, I consider it an advantage because um, I think the value of a tree far outweighs the value of a lawn. Now, we are all entitled to our own um, opinions about our love of lawn or, or not. Um, but to me, actually shading the lawn grass is kind of an advantage. Now, if I'm wanting to put plantings underneath something, then yes, um, an established big tree trying to plant underneath it, it is a challenge. However, if you're planting a tree, go ahead and start your underplantings because then they will grow up together and the roots will all find their own place. You can still establish an underplanting under an established tree. It's just harder and it will take more care from you and more water from you, especially if it's a maple. Um, they can drop, trees can drop twigs, leaves and flowers, and it can be messy. And so um, <clears throat> you quickly learn which trees those are. So certainly, um, Oaks drop acorns, and sometimes those can be prolific. Walnuts, certainly a black walnut there above your deck, not the best placement. 
persimmons are messy. They're also desirable to, in some ways, cherries. So think about that. Think about, you know, that yes, the fruit has wildlife value, but think about where you place it in your landscape. Um, also size. So for instance, I love tulip poplar. I just love that tree. I want one in my, you know, garden, but they're huge. <laughs> huge, huge. So I have to be realistic about that and, and its placement. And if I want a tulip poplar, I mean, I happen to, to be lucky to have more space, but <clears throat> if I didn't, I probably would choose to have three smaller trees instead of one large tulip poplar. Now, if your cottage is larger, you can plant tulip poplars. That's fine. It's no problem. Um, look for good um, species or cultivars. So again, Magnolia grandiflora, if you love that tree, don't plant a seedling or one of the larger cultivars if you don't have the space. We have all seen those magnolias that swamp houses. And in a way, I find it kind of charming, although I wouldn't want to live in the house that it was eating. Um, like I said, little gem or teddy bear magnolias are better choices. I really like teddy bear right now. Um, and before you choose or after you choose, um, watch out for other things that can impact your trees in your landscape. So good trees that are treated badly and watch out for those mediocre trees with bad traits. And when I say bad traits, I mean bad landscape traits. So again, something that you might put in the back 40 um, is may not be the same thing that you would put up near your house. So one thing that I think probably most of all of you are aware of is a, not a good practice is this topping of trees, which is the lopping off to reduce the size. And it usually happens when a plant, a tree has been planted in the wrong place, or it's the tree ultimately is going to get too big, but the person plants it anyway, or the landscaper plants it anyway. And so they just lop it off. Well, of course, what happens is where you lop it off, this proliferation of sprouts comes out and they're weak. Um, and so they'll break off disease ridden. When you do the topping, especially if it's done when there's foliage on the plant, you're taking away a lot of its resources. So it's just not a good practice. So it can go back to, um, you can, no matter what you, you know, have, you can choose not to top, but if you've put a plant that's too large in a small place, then you might be tempted to. Same thing with power lines. Watch out for that. We've all seen this happen. So when you're planting, believe the ultimate height stats that you read about trees. It is so hard when you have a small tree and you think, oh, that's not too close to the power line. That's not going to grow up. That's a B, give it the space that it claims it's going to need. And that kind of goes the same for planting up against a house. Because that's another thing that um, people will often do is that you, you get that river perch and it's, you know, five feet tall and it's so cute. It looks like almost like a Japanese maple, you know, and you plant it too close to the house. Well, you will be cutting it down later. And that actually has happened to my parents, even though I advised them otherwise. Um, there are other trees that are great um, outdoors or in the wild that are not so great in a landscape. So sycamore, for instance, absolutely gorgeous tree, um, but it, it's fast growing and it has beautiful bark, but it cannot take drought. It has rampant roots. It's brittle and it gets huge. So if you're not going to be giving supplemental water, um, you're going to half the year, your tree's going to look like this, or the foliage is going to look like this. So sycamore, as beautiful it is, is not a, a recommended landscape tree. Pawpaw, <laughs> very interesting small tree um, with beautiful fruit. It has somewhat good fall color. Um, it's this tropical, it's this relative of really a tropical tree family that we get blessed with here in um, the Southeast. However, it grows as a colony or a clone. So just be aware if you're planting one that eventually you are going to get a colony. You're going to get a pawpaw patch. Okay. So you can mow and chop and prune and pull and thin and cut and wrench, wrench and extract, but it will still come back. So this picture down on the bottom left, there's, that's a pawpaw patch. This is actually at my house. 
Um, and it's relatively near to the house and you can see this fence. And so I've put this, I've marked this on the slide, this pink mark. We'll come over to the middle picture and that pink mark is on the other side of the fence. And do you see the little sprout coming up? Yep, that's from that pawpaw patch, okay? Which you can mow it, you can cut it down, but be aware that's gonna happen. That's gonna happen, so. Um, perfect form female persimmon. That's a beautiful persimmon there. But guess where the fruits land? Yep, right in the driveway. Okay. So that's a, that's a case of placement. Of course, if you like to make persimmon pudding, then maybe you're perfectly happy to have a persimmon next to your driveway. Um, very common mistake is planting too close to the house. So there's a weeping yopon holly that's leaning because it's so close. The river birch is the classic too close to the house and the birch will, whoops, the birch will also have those surface roots eventually. That's a white birch that's shown, but river birch can do it too and kind of buckle up. River birch is a good tree. Just don't plant it too close to your house. Um, it also doesn't love drought. So what can you do if you've got these problems? Um, or you can see them coming. So you may have Godzilla or this really shocking tree here. Okay, so in Larry's words, cut them down and rip them out before they grow up, especially volunteers you don't really want. Trees are an investment in your future. And I always like to say about plants when people get kind of protective and they're like, I can't prune my plant or I can't pull that up. They aren't puppies. They aren't puppies. It's okay. <laughs> so many native and non-native trees can seed themselves into established beds. So be vigilant and don't let the plants push you around. In other words, if you don't want that, if you don't need any more hackberries in your landscape or tulip poplars, weed them out. Absolutely weed them out. Or you'll be doing this one day, cutting the tree down increment by increment, just the way that it grew. So a few more trees to watch out for in the landscape, black walnut. Um, and that's, you know, one of the reasons is the messy fruits. If you're, if you are into black walnuts, you may want the messy fruits, but they are very messy. And now the black walnuts have got a disease or are susceptible to this thousands canker disease. And so you may, you know, have your beautiful black walnut and get this disease and it's very hard to treat. So it's not a tree that I would recommend planting. You may choose to leave it, but know what it's going to give you. Silver maple. Silver maples in theory are beautiful. The dream, that's what they, we want them to look like. This is what they often look like. And this is what often has to happen, okay? So talk to your neighbors extension agent, friends, look at trees that are failing in landscapes. What are they? You know? And silver maple for us um, is, is one of them, even though it is a native tree. Um, it's short-lived, it's fast growing, but it's brittle and it falls apart. Hackberry, I was talking with Karen about her hackberry, but it is not a tree that I recommend for the landscape near the home, near a patio, here, um, the, you know, outdoor furniture and that sort of thing. Again, it is, it has a really wonderful wildlife value, but there are also, it's not a rare tree. There are plenty and plenty of hackberries around. Um, and it is something that you could, again, choose to leave on the back 40. But if you're going to have one tree in your, your garden, I wouldn't choose a hackberry. And Two of the, the issues, even though there are the benefits, two of the issues are the sooty mold that you will often see on the foliage of the hackberry. And this is actually crepe myrtle foliage, but it's showing the um, sooty mold on it. And that's from the aphids that are feeding on the tree, dropping the honeydew and the mold is growing. The other one, you may have seen these interesting, but disfiguring galls on hackberry leaves and it can just cover them. Um, and those are called nipple galls. And they're from this little critter here, which is about an eighth of an inch long called a, a stillid. 
Sweet gum has amazing fall color, but it has these fruits, AKA the sticker balls. What do you do with sweet gum balls besides step on them and yelp? Well, you can use them for mulch. They do feed the birds. My favorite use is to spray paint them and use them for holiday decorations. So if you've got a sweet gum, make the best of it. Make the best of it. Probably not one you want to plant. However, there is this really fascinating cultivar um, called Slender Silhouette. Previously, I mean, it's still out there is a cultivar called Rotunda Loba, which is a fruitless sweet gum, but it has proven to be not strong, not a, not a good grower, not a healthy tree, which is unfortunate because it's, it's a great concept um, because they're, you know, the, to get rid of the sweet gum balls. But pillar sweet gum here has this just absolutely like skyrocket appearance. It does have good fall color and has very, very few fruits, very few fruits. And I realize I'm running out of time. So I'm going to just quickly go through these last um, slides. There are a few trees, you know, keep yourself aware of the current diseases out there, which is sad. It's so sad. The hemlock adelgid, the emerald ash borer, we've known for a long time about Dutch elm disease. So those would be trees that, you know, you have, you see this ash coming up in your tree and ash is you know, beautiful. I mean, it coming up into your yard and they have beautiful fall color, but you know, right now there's going to be a problem with the ash borer and you're probably not going to have a long life for that tree. So a few recommendations, although this presentation is not really about specific recommendations. It's about how you think about trees in your landscape. So I hope that you have gotten um, some food for thought, some food for thought about how to think about trees in your landscape. Um, very quickly, I'll just flip through these. Um, Sweet Bay Magnolia, although it is not, um, is barely native to Tennessee, it's certainly native in the Southeast and is the one evergreen that um, I love to suggest. It's not as showy as the Southern Magnolia, but it has still fragrant flowers um, and a very manageable form. Plus it hosts all those charismatic um, butterflies and moths you see down there. Southern sugar maple, or for y'all in Tennessee, you can also grow Northern sugar maple. Us not so much in the Carolinas, it doesn't do nearly as well. Um, it's a classic, but really a fantastic um, landscape tree in all respects. If you have less space, chalk maple. You may have to search this out, but chalk maple is a smaller, essentially a smaller native sugar maple type tree with amazing fall color. Black gum is one of my favorite um, that I would recommend. It has practically zero pests and diseases and it is um, wonderful food for the birds and fantastic fall color. American basswood, it's one that you just don't see as much and um, you get wonderful, the bees adore it, um, the basswood honey, you can make tea from the flowers and it hosts this little um, number is 142 different insects. Oaks, oaks of all type. Oaks are slow growing. So, you know, many of us are older. We might not, if we plant an, a, a white oak acorn, we may not grow to see that white oak in its full glory. But a couple of the oaks you can buy that are more available in container or small ball and burlap, a Schumard oak um, or a willow oak. Both of those are somewhat faster growing. You can appreciate your oak tree while you're still here to appreciate it. A yellow wood um, is an interesting smaller tree um, with good fall color. These interesting, it's in the pea family. Um, white flowers and this smooth bark. So it's one if you're um, not as familiar with, it's worth seeking out kind of um, instead of a red bud, just because red buds are so common, but red buds are phenomenal. Speaking of another common plant, dogwood. 
I mean, it's world famous. You got to have a dogwood, 101 species that it's supporting there of insects. If you don't want a dogwood, have a silver bell, Halesia diptera, nice um, clear yellow fall color, beautiful spring flowers, big leaf magnolia to amaze your children and grandchildren with those leaf litter. There's nothing like it. Largest leaves of any um, a single leaf tree, non-compound leaves in North America. And then an odd one or one you don't see very much, but I think worth seeking out is American smoke tree. Beautiful fall color, very interesting leaves and subtle flowers. The flowers and um, seed plumes that you're seeing here on the right is actually from the hybrid of Asian or European species and the American species called Grace. And that's the one that has this pink color. So our native one has the white, but has beautiful fall color. So how do you choose? As with dogs, you have to get to learn their traits, get to know them a little, then make the best picks based on your needs and desires. Um, how do you know their traits? You visit botanical gardens and private gardens. You ask experienced people, use reliable internet sources like extension services and good books. Make a list of the traits that matter to you. Be honest and confident. In other words, don't let what other people think, you know, influence you too much. Be honest and confident about what matters to you and rate each trait and its importance. A few books that are recommended. I mean, there's so many good books, but this is a really interesting one if you haven't seen it, Essential Native Trees and Shrubs of Eastern United States. Those two authors have put together quite a few lists of trees for different situations, and they have a really good ranking system. Um, of course, Native Plants of the Southeast, an older book, Gardening with Native Plants of the South. And then two of my favorite that are not for selecting trees, but just for appreciation is that Natural History of, of North American Trees by Petey and Trees of the South by Charlotte Green. So finally, the last is um, you can be methodical about it, just like with the dogs and make a table of traits. Okay. Make a table of traits that matter to you and assign values. So with one being less desirable, three being desirable, and for in this, for instance, I did growth rate, size, drought resistance, fall color, messy or extra maintenance, wildlife food, nice bark flowers, or other attractive traits. And then here's some other suggestions. This is pretty much what was on the previous slide. Things to consider. It, this is a process and an exercise, and it's really a not so sneaky way to help you to get to know your trees. Okay. So here's just an example of some of the rankings. And it was based on what my desire was. So, you know, mature size, what you decide to rank it is going to depend on whether you want a giant tree or you want a small tree. So you have to have your own system of ranking, but then you can balance the numbers that you come up with, with your emotion and with what you think. So once you're done, take a rest in your cherry tree, enjoy your garden. And I had to include this slide after Dr. Millichamp told me this was his, you know, based on his presentation. Most of these were his slides. I just tweaked them. And I said, well, I might take the donkey out. And he said, well, you know, I have put that slide in every single presentation he has ever given. So there you go. It's the end. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and I'm sorry I went over. Thank you for your patience. Oh, no problem. No problem. Really entertaining and very helpful for um, any of us that uh, are, are making decisions about trees. I know uh, Brian Hendricks, you're always mulling around what to do about trees. Hopefully this helped you a little bit. But uh, Paula, thank yes. you. This was delightful. Um, Let's see, do we have questions in the chat? Yeah. 
Very nice. <laughs> and yes, it's being recorded. This will be posted on our website um, by the end of the week and should have access to it. Uh, are there any questions? I'm sure Paula will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yep. Uh, unmute yourselves and, and uh, speak up, please. Um, Paula, this is Kim Sadler. Wonderful presentation. Hi. I, um, I have a just a fondness for trees. They are the largest organism that probably most of us will ever uh, be up close and personal with. And I don't think, True. think about it like that. But I am trying to get sassafras to grow and I realize that they like the pawpaw they're clonal yep so when I find them on a fence row and have dug them up they haven't survived do you have any experience growing sassafras I have the same issue okay. with trying to dig them it rarely works um so if you, you can, can find them being offered by a native plant nursery then you, you're going to have a little bit better success um, because they're going to actually have like either been started from seed or, um, grown in allowed for those roots to come out. When I have tried to transplant them from suckers, I have not had success. Yeah. So I don't know if any of the other members here might have some advice, but I, so it, it may not be um, the answer you want, but maybe reassuring that. No, I it totally is reassuring. I mean, I, I can grow a lot of things, and but I've tried and tried and tried, and there's just no lateral roots. They're woody. Right. It's all woody. Even the little yep. tiny three-inch plant yep. is woody. So Right, because that's what you would expect is like the smaller I can start, you would expect to maybe in this kind of case have success, but I haven't either. Well, thank you so much. Yep. Any other questions? Wow, you were very thorough, in the, but it was thorough I, in a good way. I have a quick one. Okay, I Terry? Yes. Um, I have several winged elms that have actually come up in a like a one-third acre woodlot that um, it's kind of a succession uh -huh. after the pine beetle hit all the pine trees mm -hmm. are they are they susceptible to the elm disease or not very mm -hmm. okay yeah. yep are they beneficial well the elms in general wildlife value have huge okay. benefits um they're very weedy in the sense of like the reason you're finding them coming up is that they they weed in or seed in so, um, and their form is kind of scraggly, but if you like them, <laughs> then you can, you can plant it. Certainly wildlife value there. Um, it's in a little woodland high. area. So it's oh, not yeah. like, yeah. 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 Then I, I would, you know, I would leave them. Thank you. Oh, I had a question if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Um, my husband for our willow anniversary wanted to get me a willow tree, which I've read require water. We don't really, we live on a hill slope, so not a lot of um, resources for that. Um, and I was concerned about it being, you know, too close to the house with the willow root systems, et cetera. Um, would you advise against planting willows in the landscape? For the most part, yes, I advise against it. Yeah, for the most part. Yeah, I mean, what you say, what you have found is that's true. Now, weeping willows can be gorgeous. You have the space and you have the low spot or the ability to keep them watered and don't mind that they'll drop bits, you know, they drop pieces. Um, they can be, I mean, they're, 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 they're gorgeous. But like a black willow or something, I would not, unless you've got like a stream bank, unless you've got a back 40, a wet spot, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Okay. Right. Sorry. Right plant Seems for the right romantic, place but yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, but again, high wildlife value. So yeah. these, we need these trees in the places where, you know, they grow in the habitats of, uh, you know, wet areas and such, but not the best landscape.
and definitely keep them away from your water sources. Yes. They have the uh, incredible ability of being able to slip those smaller roots in through pipes and yep. then grow and break the piping. Yep. Um, yep. It, it can get into places where you really <laughs> wouldn't expect to have roots. Yes, good point. <laughs> Learn that the hard way. <laughs> Anyone else? Paula, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was You're absolutely welcome. delightful. Very helpful to help me focus on my property, small as it is. And uh, I'm sure it's helped a lot of others in the group as well. Well, you at least that. go out, even if you're not going to plant anything, you're not in the market to plant anything, go out and appreciate your trees for what they are. Oh, I'll go out and hug a few. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, everyone, thank you for coming tonight. Um, appreciate you being here. And we'll see you next month when our talk speaker is about uh, going to talk about uh, scientific names. She's from Spokane, um, Seattle, Washington. She'll be talking about uh, scientific names. And for some people, that's going to sound, oh, dull and awful. Because scientific names can be hard. Well, I don't think you're going to be bored. She has quite it's gonna a sense be of humor. Fascinating. She has a wonderful sense of humor and has written a book all on scientific names. So it should be fun. It should be interesting. It'll be different. And Karen, you might want to mention that it's um, a week later than our usual. It's actually a week earlier. A week earlier. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's It'll be August 9th. 9th. Yeah. Sorry. 9th, which is a week earlier than we typically earlier. meet. Yeah. Um, that's because I'll be traveling and... I hope I'll be traveling. And my I know I will not have sufficient reception to be able to manage it. So I thought we'll just move it up a week and go from there. So see you all back here and hopefully lots more on uh, August 9th. And until then, thank you, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your talk.